Thank you all for being here. My name is Penny Wright, and on behalf of us at the library, we are really pleased to have an astronomer named Kevin Manning with us this evening. Then we'd like to acknowledge Laura Moore over there, who handled a lot of the logistics for this evening, somewhat complex. And uh, we, as you can see, are, are, are videotaping uh, an hour of this program. So for those of you who have friends who missed this evening, you'll be able to go to the Rogers Memorial Library website and tell them to, uh, that they'll be able to see it online within the next month or so. <clears throat> I'd like to introduce Kevin Manning to you. Uh, his background as a scientist in astrophysics and an educator has enabled him to teach and inform the public on astronomical events, which he does far and wide. He is passionate about his work and has worked as a consultant for NASA and worked with the images taken by the Chandra X-ray Observatory with other scientists at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics as well as at other observatories. Mr. Manning has served as president of an astronomy organization that began in 1937 and helped in funding and building a large observatory. Maybe he'll tell us a little bit about that. Working as a Wright Fellow at Tufts University and as an Einstein Fellow with the U.S. House of Representatives on Capitol Hill in Washington, uh, Mr. Manning uh, uh, got opportunities to fine-tune his skills. Most recently, he's been a regular presenter for the National Park Service at the Wilderness Visitors Center on Fire Island National Seashore. Please join me in welcoming Kevin Manning. and Laura and everyone for your help in arranging this program tonight. Thank you for coming tonight. It looks like the weather is cooperating, so we got clear skies, so we'll keep our fingers crossed for clear skies after the program is over, so we can actually do some astronomy. Uh, astronomy for Everyone, Size and Scale of the Universe is the title of my program tonight, and I want you to keep in mind this subtitle, Size and scale of the universe. We're going to be talking about the universe from the very small to the very large and everything in between as well. I'd like to begin with a quote from a famous astronomer named Edwin P. Hubble. Dr. Hubble, of course, is the person for which the Hubble Space Telescope was named in honor of and uh, really uh, found out a lot of incredible things about the universe. Equipped with his five senses, man explores the universe around him and calls the experience or adventure science. Now the word science comes from a Latin word, sciere, S-C-I-R-E, which literally means to know. So when we do science, we want to know things. Well, we all have curiosity. We all want to know answers to questions. So uh, we, can, uh, we can certainly research and, and find a lot of answers by investigating. I also like to begin uh, by asking everyone how many knew that last year, all year 2009, was declared the International Year of Astronomy. Okay, an enthusiastic hand over here, good for you. All right, we got another hand back here, a couple of people. Um, last year was the International Year of Astronomy, and what made last year so special that the United Nations would declare the whole world the International Year of Astronomy, over 100 nations uh, participated, even in the U.S. Congress passed a resolution supporting IYA, uh, is because 400 years previous in 1609, Galileo Galilei, you know, the mathematician, the scientist, the astronomer, turned the first telescope to the night sky. That happened in 1609. And uh, how many 400th anniversaries do we get to celebrate in our lifetime? Not too many, I suspect. So was it a big deal? Kind of. And uh, the website up there that you see, uh, you still go there. They have a revised website that that links to now for post-IYA or post-International Year of Astronomy. I also like to begin with a quote from a gal named Denise Hudson who has encapsulated in words and articulated very eloquently how I feel about astronomy at a gut or emotional level. Can I share that with you? For anyone who has dared to look up and wonder at the splendor of a starry sky, the appeal of astronomy may be beckoning. Submit to it in the slightest, and you may get hooked. Once you do, the universe and your place in it 
will never look the same. Astronomy is an experience that allows you to pace yourself. So take heart. You can go as slowly or as quickly as you like. The universe is a very patient place, one that doesn't mind waiting while we take the first steps towards understanding. The Milky Way in all its glory shows itself best to the unaided eye. To experience the full impact of a meteor shower, the best optics in town are still two eyeballs. If you stare into the night long enough, gaseous nebulae and glittering star clusters begin to emerge, and perhaps a blazing fireball briefly interrupts the calm. Through a pair of binoculars, hundreds of stars are suddenly where only darkness was moments ago. Colors jump out at you as you scan for red giants like Betelgeuse, or hot blue stars like Sirius. Star clusters assault your vision as thousands of pinpoints of light reveal themselves clearly. It's a view you'll be drawn to again and again. Even more compelling is a good long look through a telescope. Sure, we've all seen pictures of them, but how many here have actually seen the ice crystal rings of Saturn through a telescope before? Okay, got a few hands up. For the rest of you, how many would like to see the rings of Saturn through a telescope? Okay. I'm afraid it's not up tonight until uh, pretty late. It'll be long after we've gone home. However, we do have the planet Mars up this evening. And how many have noticed a bright yellow light in the sky, like a, a bright star setting soon after the sunset? As soon as it gets dark, over in the west, there's a bright yellow star. Anybody notice that lately? That is the planet Jupiter. Jupiter will be have set already by the time we go outside, but Mars will be high up in the sky. And of course, we have a waxing gibbous moon to look at as well. Because you know, the moon is our closest neighbor in space, and it would stun even the most composed beginner. So you're in for a real treat. Suddenly, the great red spot of Jupiter appears in color, and the cloud belts of its upper atmosphere take on definition. The polar ice caps of Mars are within easy reach, as you will see later, as well as hundreds of galaxies, nebulae, and star clusters. Astronomy is truly an enjoyable experience. It's a backyard event or a trek to a dark sky site for an extended stay. It's for long, quiet hours alone with family and friends or uh, by yourself for an extended stay. So go ahead and take a look. You have nothing to lose and literally a universe to gain. Did she do a good job of that? Yeah. Now, the agenda for this evening, as you see on your handout there, uh, we're going to be talking about an astronomy evaluation. It looks like a quiz. Don't worry, everybody passes. It's more of a topic opener than anything else, okay? Also, we're going to look at a daily observation log that the library was kind enough and reproducing for us. Uh, we'll also look at the sky show, what's available during the day, but mainly in the evening. Telescopes, a brief introduction, the different types, how they perform and function. But the meat of our talk again is size and scale of the universe. That's when it gets very exciting. If time permits, we'll engage in a couple of hands-on activities, survival on the moon, and the Messier objects. Okay, so let's begin with our astronomy evaluation page that you all have in front of you. If you don't have a handout, please raise your hand. We'll give one to you immediately. Okay, it looks like uh, everybody has one. So number one, it says, the name of the North Star. Who knows the name of the North Star here? Yes? Polaris. Good job, young man. Polaris is the name of the North Star. That's letter C on your paper there. If you want to circle C, is the correct answer. Polaris, the North Star, is the end of the handle of the Little Dipper, the bigger part thereof of a constellation called Ursa Minor, the Little Bear. And it lies in a position in the sky where the axis, the north axis of the Earth appears to be pointing to in the sky. Not directly, but very close. Certainly close enough to be called our North Star. Number two, the brightest star seen in the night sky. Yes? Sirius. Are you serious? That's right. That's right. Letter B, Sirius is the name of the brightest star. Uh, now, quick question. What came first, the satellite radio company or the star? And, of course, I say that in jest, but I do bring a point home simultaneously. And that is, don't we tend to name a lot of things on the Earth after astronomical objects? Yeah. Right? The Saturn car line, for example. But they were here long before, were they not? For example, what's the name of our galaxy? 
Milky Way, what came first, the candy bar or the galaxy? Some people think the candy bar, no, it was the galaxy, okay? Sirius is the name of the brightest star, it's the alpha star, we use the Greek alphabet, the alpha or brightest star in the constellation Canis Major, the big dog, so we commonly refer to it as the dog star. It will be up tonight where we can see it very plainly, and I'll point that out to you, along with the constellation Orion and some other uh, constellations that are up in the winter sky. Number three, the unit used to measure distances to stars beyond our solar system. Light year, good job. Light year, that's number B, a letter B again. Light year is its name. Does anybody here know the speed of light? Yes. Go ahead. Take your time. All right. Three is a good number. It's it's actually three. It's it's. Yes, it's millions. But you're right with the three. Yeah. Yeah. It's a hundred. If we go English, it's 186,000 miles per second, right? And if we want to go metric with that, then it's uh, 3 million, million kilometers per second. And of course, if we want to use scientific notation and make it even more confusing, then we'll say it's 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. But either way, it gets worse and worse. It's a big number, is it not? Let's say 186,000 miles per second. Wow, that's a lot to chew on. Let me offer a suggestion to make it a little more palatable for us, where we can sink our teeth into it a little deeper. Let's all go to the local airport. We're going to board a Delta jet, and we're going to fly to China. Anybody here been to China before? Okay. I have too. It's a long trip, is it not? It's halfway around the world, a long plane trip. Let's say we board that jet, and we're going to fly to China. We're going along with the jet stream, so we're going to average a speed of about 625 miles an hour. Now, the Earth's diameter is 8,000 miles across times pi for the circumference, so all the way around the Earth is 25,000 miles. Now let's say we get to China and we go, ah, I'm tired. Let's just go back home. We'll feel midair. We won't have to stop at any hub. And we'll just keep flying all the way back around to New York. How long would it take for that round trip at airplane <coughs> speed, jet speed? About 40, 40 hours, exactly. About 40 hours of time it would take at that speed going around the Earth. Well, that's not bad, wouldn't you say, to go around a whole planet in 40 hours, a little over a day and a half, under two days, around the whole, sure beats walking, right? <laughs> but what if I was to tell you we can get around the planet Earth, not once, not twice, but seven and a half times in one second? <laughs> and we wound up in China anyhow, didn't we? Seven and a half times around the world in one second. Ladies and gentlemen, the speed of light is like going from the Earth to the moon and back round trip in less than three seconds. Could you imagine if the Apollo astronauts who first landed on the moon between missions Apollo 11 and 17, that they went to the moon and what if they were told, hey guys, you're going to get to the moon today in 1.3 seconds because that's how long it takes the speed of light to reach the moon, 240,000 miles away. That's the speed of light. It's the fastest thing we know of. So how far would it go in a whole year? Well, if it travels 186,000 miles in a second, 60 seconds in a minute, times 3,600 in an hour, times about 24 hours in a day, times about 365 and a quarter days in a year, what do you get? A big number, right? Yeah. It's just under 6 trillion miles in one light year. And I'm not talking about the deficit. Six trillion miles in one light year, and that is a large measuring stick, wouldn't you agree? But is it the biggest we use in astronomy today? It's actually not. Let me introduce the concept of the largest measuring stick that we actually use. If you don't mind looking a little silly, I'm going to do it first, so I'm doing it with you, okay? Hold your index finger out about eight inches in front of your nose. Close your left eye so you're looking at your finger and the respective background beyond your finger. Then close your right eye while staring at the finger. Now blink back and forth, back and forth with the two eyes. Please describe your experience or your observation. It seems to move. It seems to move. It seems to shift back and forth. Now you know you're not moving your finger. You're holding it still, right? So what makes it appear to move? Could it be that our left eye looks at the finger from this angle, and over here on the other side of our head, our right eye is looking at the same finger 
from a different angle. Aren't we forming a little triangle when we do that? Remember triangulation, uh, a method to measure distances to objects? So if we measure the baseline, and in this case that would be the diopter separation between our eyes, which is different for each person, and then we measure the amount of shift of our finger. Now we call that a parallactic shift, parallax. How many have heard of that word before? You've heard of it, right? Parallax, P-A-R-A-L-L-A-X is how you spell it. Now that, let's say that parallactic shift was measured as well. Then using those two numbers, you can easily calculate the distance to your finger. But we're not interested in that distance. We're interested in the distance of something much further away, a distant star in our galaxy. How far would it actually be? Well, let's say we increase our baseline from this to the distance from the sun to the earth. 93 million miles averaging. It's called one astronomical unit. And as the earth revolves around the sun in its annual journey, I'm going to switch uh, positions here. Here's the earth over here now. As it comes over on this side of the sun six months later, now we've got double 93 or 186 million mile baseline for our triangle. And let's say the amount of shift of that star is so small that we can't even see it with our eyes. I want to uh, introduce the concept again. In science, we like to use models to represent abstract concepts. So I'm using this model of what we call the celestial sphere. Notice this uh, ball that I have here. It's a sphere with the outside painted with these patterns of stars as they appear up in the night sky. And they are positionally correct on the sphere. Now let's say we're standing on top of a marble in the middle of the sphere. We're on top of the earth looking up as if we're inside this great big ball of, of the sky. Now what if I was to trace out a single solitary line all the way around inside of that ball? What geometric figure did I just draw? A circle. How many degrees in a circle? 360 degrees in a circle. Now what if I was to tell you the full moon takes up a part of that circle, and we call a piece of that circle an arc, it's like an arc line, right? We'll call it a half a degree of arc. The moon takes up a half a degree of arc in the sky. All right? Often we talk about the moon at arm's length with holding a dime in our hand or something like that. That's not very accurate, though. We use angular measure to measure accurately the apparent diameter of objects in the sky. It doesn't mean how big they really are, it's how big they appear. Well, the moon appears to be a half a degree of arc. So my question to you is, how many full moons would it take side by side to go all the way around next to each other and fit inside of that circle just neatly? 720, good job. Because it's 360 degrees, each moon is a half a degree, so it's double that. 720 full moons would neatly fit around the circle in that sky. Now, let's say the amount of parallactic shift of our star in question with our biggest measuring stick in astrophysics today is so small, it's actually 1 1,800th the diameter of the full moon. And by the way, I want to interject this too. The sun, <coughs> during the day, uh, when we look at the photosphere of the sun, how big do you think the sun's disk is in the sky? <coughs> Excuse me. It's also a half a degree of arc. The sun and the moon appear to be the same exact size disks in the sky. Now, you might think, well, that's a little puzzling because the sun is a star. Stars are really big things. It dwarfs the earth, let alone the moon, which is much smaller than the earth. So how could it be that they appear to be the same size in the sky? Could it be that, okay, go ahead. It's also a lot further away. Good job, young man. The sun is 400 times larger in diameter than the earth, but it's also 400 times further away from us than the earth. You see, ladies and gentlemen, the size to distance ratios are precisely identical. And if it wasn't for that fact, we wouldn't experience a total solar eclipse as we do. And that would have been a major consequence to Albert Einstein. Okay, so the parallactic shift of our star is 1 1,800th the diameter of the full moon. We can't see it with our eyes, but we can measure it with a high-powered detector, a telescope, if you will. At one arc second is what we call that shift. How far would the star be with the baseline of 186 million miles? 
it would lie at a distance from the Earth of 3.26 light years away. We call it one parsec. Par for parallax and sec for second of arc. One parsec equals 3.26 light years. Now can we add a metric prefix in front of that? What's a kilogram? 1,000 grams. grams, right? Kilo means 1,000. So one kilo parsec equals 3,260 light years. That, ladies and gentlemen, is our biggest measuring stick in astrophysics that we use. All right? Yes? So a light year, if you were to measure it, what exactly is the um, uh, statistic? Light it's, a, it's just under 6 trillion miles. It's a distance light travels in one year. Just under 6 trillion miles. Now, if we, uh, if we consider that parsec, by the way, any Star Trek fans here? Anybody see the uh, fairly recent movie, the remake of the original series? Did they pull it off? I was shocked because I'm a big fan of the original Star Trek, and uh, I was Captain Kirk by then, back then, by the way. Okay, I was a wannabe. <laughs> but uh, remember Chekhov would have a habit of saying, Captain Kirk was so many parsecs from the planet, right? Well, now you know what he meant by that, and you know what he may not know himself, and that is how we came up with the word parsec, all right? So a kiloparsec, again, 3,260 light years. So in this celestial sphere, what if I was to take this celestial sphere, representing the night sky, and crush it into a flat two-dimensional plane? What object would I have created? Well, I would have created one of these. It's called a planisphere. All right? It's a flat two-dimensional plane representation of the celestial sphere model. Why do we want to flatten it? Well, we can create cardboard cutouts, and we can have one mounted in the center to the other, a circular one inside of a square one, if you will, and I could turn it like a dial, and I could adjust it, and I could face north, south, east, or west, and turn the entire uh, planisphere uh, in the direction I'm facing, line it up, and then I can adjust the dial for the day of the month and the time of the evening I'm observing. And then in this cutout window here, this elliptical cutout there, I should be able to hold it up in front of me, facing that direction, and recognize those star patterns, those constellations that are illustrated here on this planisphere. That's the technical name of it. We commonly refer to this as a star finder. Now, if you'll quickly look at the next page after your evaluation, we'll go back to that in just a moment. You should have a daily, uh, first of all, you have instructions for completing a daily observation log. Now, this is my creation. So you, are, uh, you have my permission to reproduce it all you want, use it a thousand years into the future. Make copies of it for your children, your grandchildren, etc. if you'd like. All right? Uh, the instructions for the daily observation log, I try to be detailed and thorough enough that I covered all the bases. So you should find it user-friendly at home when you use it. And then the next page shows an actual copy of the daily observation log with the data that you would write in those blank lines. All right? So go back to the front page again. Astronomy evaluation with me, please. And let's go to question number four now. The number of stars visible in the night sky for the average person. The answer is A, 3,000. It's about 3,000 stars in one celestial hemisphere. Number five, how many constellations are there all together in the night sky, northern and southern celestial hemispheres? Yes? 88. 88 is correct, that's right. As of 1930, the International Astronomical Union uh, declared that there are 88 official constellations with their associated boundaries so that we actually segmented the entire night sky into little pieces of a puzzle, if you will. And we, we can determine any celestial object, be it a galaxy or a star cluster, position in regards to which constellation's boundaries it lies in. Number uh, six here says the constellation that contains the pointer stars used to locate the North Star. That's right, good job. Ursa Major, number six is the letter B, Ursa Major, commonly called the Big Bear, the biggest part thereof, the Big Dipper, and the end of the bowl of the Big Dipper opposite the handle are called the pointer stars because from the bottom to the top they tend to point in the general direction of Polaris, our North Star. That's why we call them the pointers. They're a signpost in the sky to help us find our way around. Uh, number seven, how bright a star appears in the sky? 
A is correct, apparent magnitude. Let me introduce the concept of the magnitude scale to you very quickly and simply. Let's say we're all back in high school and we're on a track team. And there are six people who are going to race. And you with me, we're, we're one of the racers, okay? And in that foot race with the other five people, six of us all together, we break the tape. We come in first place. We're the fastest runner in that race, right? How about the sixth place person? Well, they may be fast too, but they're the last person to come in in that race. There are five people behind us. You see, ladies and gentlemen, according to the original magnitude scale we derived from a few hundred years ago, the intent was a first magnitude star is the brightest star of them all. A sixth magnitude star is the faintest star we can see with our unaided eye on a dark, clear country night for the average person. Difference of five magnitudes or a hundred times difference in brightness. A first magnitude star is a hundred times brighter than a sixth magnitude star. Here's what I want you to remember from this. The higher the number of magnitude, the fainter the star. The lower the number of magnitude, the brighter the star. Will you remember that? It's an inverse relationship. Okay? All right. So back to uh, number, we're on number uh, eight, a plot of a star's luminosity versus its temperature on a graph. I think I heard somebody say C. It is C, the HR diagram. That stands for Hertzsprung Russell Diagram. Ejnar Hertzsprung and Norman Russell were two scientists that independently came up with this correlation amongst the stars of their luminosity or total energy output versus their spectral class or temperature, if you will. And uh, when they plotted the stars, they it literally revolutionized our understanding of stars and stellar life cycles. Okay, number nine, a loose collection of tens to hundreds of hot young stars. And I'm not talking about Hollywood. <laughs> yes? A nebula? No, it's not a nebula, but good guess. It's a, oh, go ahead, open star cluster is, is what we call it. And if you want to write under the word open on your paper, it's also commonly referred to as a galactic star cluster every bit as much. Open or galactic star clusters. Tens of hundreds of hot young stars. Number 10, a tightly bound, roughly spherical group of thousands to over a million stars. And these are very old stars, by the way. What would we call that? Go ahead. That's right, yes, you're right on. B, globular star cluster. Uh, they're like chandeliers, if you will, that are surrounding the region uh, centered on the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, we call the halo region of the galaxy, and we have a, a few dozen of these uh, globular star clusters. Number 10, I'm sorry, number 11, a gas and dust cloud in space. Now, in the Greek, this word literally means cloud. And he said it earlier, you were right, nebula, letter C, nebula, is a cloud of gas and dust. Number 12, most stars are composed mainly of? D, hydrogen and helium. The most abundant element by far in the universe is hydrogen, the, the lightest element, the simplest element, if you will. Number 13, comets are made up of all the following substances except, believe it or not, cometary nuclei do possess some organic compounds, silicates like sand and stuff like that. The answer is C, aluminum and calcium. The other three are all major constituents of a cometary nucleus. And number 14, in all, there are how many Messier objects? 110, good job. Now, a lot of you might be thinking, well, what is a Messier object? Don't worry, we're going to look at pictures of them in a little while. All right? We'll describe them in detail. Okay, so I'd like to uh, go on and talk about the Sky Show with you this evening. Now, during the day, of course, we have the sun, and the sun is a star. And like other stars, they are very active places, they're very hot places. The uh, nucleus of the sun, or the core of the sun, puts out about 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. That's hot enough to burn our bacon in the morning, wouldn't you say? A, nearly a million mile diameter bowl of fire, a thermonuclear furnace producing these tremendous temperatures, and lots of photons of light during these, uh, these uh, nuclear fusion reactions that it goes through, the proton-proton chain it's called. 
and traveling across this cold, dark space, 93 million miles away, providing enough heat and light to sustain life on Earth as we know it. We like our star, the sun, don't we? And the sun is, a, like other stars, a very active place. It has these things called sunspots. They're magnetic storms that occur in the sun, and they do uh, appear cyclically, minimum and maximum in amount of activity on the sun, and we're due to reach a maximum of activity in the year 2012. Anybody here see the movie 2012 that came out not long ago? Nobody? All right. I mean, I heard things about 2012, all right? Well, let me alleviate some of your fears if you're concerned. We're going to be okay, all right? The Earth is not going to come to an end in 2012. So the sun has these sunspots and magnetic storms. Because they're magnetic, they have polarity, so they come in, you know, like north and south poles. They usually come in pairs. Each dot, however, is typically, an average, larger than our planet Earth. These are very big storms. Also, we have uh, solar uh, prominences, solar flares, coronal mass ejections, all these different phenomena on active uh, stars like the sun. Now, the star, all stars like the sun are luminous objects. They give off their own light. They produce their own light. And other objects like the moon and planets, for example, reflect starlight, in our case sunlight, and we call those illuminated objects. Many years ago, we used to call the stars luminaries. Look at all the luminaries in the sky tonight. Um, now, our closest neighbor that reflects sunlight is the moon, 240,000 miles away, average. And the moon is about 2,100 miles in diameter, takes up a half a degree in the sky. And these lighter, brighter, whiter regions on the moon that you see in, in this picture here are called the highlands. They are potmarked with hills and rills and mountains and valleys and numerous impact craters on the surface of the moon. These darker areas are known as maria or seas, but they're not oceans of water at all. They're large basin regions on the moon that were impacted in, within the last four and a half billion years or so by these large rocks we call asteroids. When these asteroids collided with the moon, they dug out a large plume, a large area, that got filled in later on by lava flows, and uh, basalt, basaltic rock is very dark color, so this is a lot of basalt that you're seeing in those areas. All right? Uh, beyond the moon, uh, we have planets Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars. Those four I mentioned noteworthy because you may have a telescope at home, and with a modest-sized telescope that you might have at home, you can see features or details on each of these four planets quite easily. Beyond the planets, we have these stars that make up patterns in the sky from where we are located on Earth. We just see them as they appear in those patterns, and uh, represented a constellation here called Leo the Lion, and notice the associated constellation boundaries, like pieces of a puzzle I mentioned earlier. How many constellations altogether? 88, right? And then uh, we have stars that appear very close together. Now often we see stars that we call double stars that appear to be close together in the night sky, but one might be a lot further away in a three-dimensional understanding from the other star. In that case, we simply refer to it as an optical double. If, however, both stars reside in the same area of space where they orbit a common center of gravity, then we call that a binary star system. Variable stars vary in their brightness cyclically. They get brighter, then dimmer, then brighter, then dimmer for a few different reasons. Open clusters and globular clusters we have defined. Nebulae I put into two categories here. Planetary nebulae resemble a planet in that they have roughly spherical boundaries of gas and dust. Literally, a star blew out its outer layer in the space to form this roughly spherical region that we call a planetary nebula. And our example given here is Messier number 57 on that list of 110 Messier objects. And it's called the famous Ring Nebula in the constellation Lyra, a summer constellation. Messier 42 is our example given for a diffuse nebula, the Great Orion Nebula, we call it, in the constellation Orion. I'll point it out to you this evening. A diffuse nebula means it's spread out. It's like a puff of smoke. It's all over the place. It's literally a stellar nursery 1,500 light years away from us where new stars are being born as we speak. 
Now, everything up till now that I've described is within our own Milky Way galaxy. Beyond our galaxy are hundreds of billions of other island universes, each containing a hundred billion stars or more and gas and dust. So we call them external galaxies to ours. Then we have the list of 110 M objects. Telescopes, very briefly, there are two types of telescopes. There are refractors and there are reflectors. Now, as you can see here, we have a lens here that represents a refractor telescope because when light goes through it, it is bent or refracted. The other kind, called a reflector, uses a mirror that reflects light. And if we introduce a light path into that same view, now we can see what it does to light. As an example, coming, reflecting off the moon from the sun, 240,000 miles away, traveling at the speed of light through the slit opening of our dome of our observatory, here we can see light coming in straight parallel rays and going through this denser medium of this glass lens and being bent or refracted by the curvature of these lenses as well to a focus like a cone-shaped cone of light reaching a focus back here where an image of the moon is produced on a piece of cheesecloth. This point where we call the focal point, the distance from that to the objective lens that is bending the light is called the focal length. And here's the same lens mounted inside of an optical tube assembly, a completed refractor telescope without a mounting, if you will. On the reflector telescope, you have light coming in a basically hollow tube in straight parallel rays, bouncing off a mirror that has a curve in the front surface of it that's inside. It's, it's curved inward like the inside of a spoon. We call that a concave curve. And by virtue of that curvature, the light is caused to also converge to a focus. It would focus here, but our head would be in the way of the incoming light if we tried to view the image here. So we needed to introduce another mirror here, a secondary mirror, if you will. Technically, it's called a diagonal mirror. It's a flat or plane-shaped mirror that is set at a 45-degree angle to the light path. And 45 plus 45 is 90 degrees, so it sends the light path out on a 90 degree angle outside the tube of the telescope. If you look at my telescope that I brought in here tonight, you can see that the focuser is here just like it is here. This is this type of telescope. It's called a classic Newtonian reflector. Why? Because Isaac Newton actually created it a few hundred years ago. So we named it after him. The other kind of reflector that also uses a mirror, we also call them compound telescopes because they're usually shorter tube assemblies by virtue of a steeper curved mirror that uh, sends a steep cone of light up and then is intercepted by a secondary mirror here. Now, the, the face of this mirror facing down is curved outward like a ball. We call that a convex curve. It's technically a hyperbola, a hyperbolic curve. And because the rays that are converging now reach this mirror that is going to diverge or spread the light out more, it causes the amount of convergence to be gentler and effectively extend the distance the light comes to a focus. So it'll go back down through the tube and through a hole in the middle of the primary mirror, just like a donut, and out the rear of the tube where the image can be inspected there. Classic Cassegrain type of reflector telescope. Yes? For a true novice, what would you suggest? Something that's reasonably that's a, that's, that involves a very lengthy answer. Can we address that later? Okay. I'll get back with you. Please, uh, even if we're looking through the telescope, then I'll entertain that completely for you. All right. So uh, here we have the refractors and reflectors. Now, if you think about it, uh, did anybody notice by chance the true view of the moon here in the sky, in this picture, versus a virtual image of the moon produced here by the telescope? What's the difference between those two? It's inverted. It's an inverted image. Some people will say upside down. Well, it's, it's actually, yes, it is upside down. If you hold your paper like this in front of you, and then you simply turn it like this. You see, right now, this side of the page is your right as you face me. What is it now? Now it's your left, right? So it's not only upside down, but it's twisted around as well, right and left and left and right. We call that an inverted image. What makes the image become inverted? So you probably know, but as light rays converge together and they cross each other, right on the other side, they flip the image around as an inverted image. Now our eye has a lens, though it's not made of glass or plastic, it's made of cells, but it does the same function. It causes light to bend or refract to a focus 
right in the back of our eye on the, on the retina, and that image of what we look at with our eye is inverted. It's sent to the brain via the optic nerve, and the brain turns the image right side back up. How many knew you had a built-in image erector inside your brain? You don't have to think about it. It does it automatically, doesn't it? How many also know that you have a built-in diaphragm in your brain? Anybody do that? I'll prove it to you. Uh, how many have gone into the bathroom at night, and by virtue of the ambient light from the hallway or adjacent rooms, and right when you were about to flip the light switch on, you caught your eye in the mirror, and as soon as the light went on, you literally saw your pupils shrink. They got smaller. How many experienced that before? Okay, a handful of us. For the rest of us, can I give a homework assignment? What I want you to do tonight is find your way into the bathroom, put your hand on that switch, gaze on the mirror, and as soon as you flip that switch on, I guarantee you, you will see your pupils get smaller. Now, your spouse might say to you, honey, what are you doing? All right, and you can explain to them this crazy scientist at the library tonight told me to do this. Come join me, you'll, you'll, it'll be fun. All right, you'll both experience that. You will see your pupils get smaller. Why? Because on a bright, sunny day, your pupils get small because there's so much bright light around. But on a dark night, when there's no lights around at all, our pupils open to a maximum opening for a young person that's about seven millimeters across, about a quarter of an inch in diameter. All right? And we don't have to think about it, but the brain operates that automatically for the light conditions. Now, how many people here own a pair of these? Just regular <coughs> bird watching binoculars? Seems like most of everyone in the room does. You've probably seen these before if you don't own one. Now, these regular binoculars, they adjust. They allow us to use both eyes at the same time. We are bioptic by nature, and thereby retain our depth of perception advantage that that gives us. So when we look at the moon through a pair of binoculars, it appears in 3D. It looks like it's a solid uh, ball up there. Now, it adjusts for the diopter separation of our eyes, which is different for each person, so we can adjust it that way. And also, on the back of the binoculars, it's labeled with the number 7x35. We call it 7 by 35 binoculars. The 7x means that objects through these will appear to be seven times larger in diameter than with the unaided eye alone. The second number, the 35, is a diameter of the primary objective lens in millimeters. Now, these are 35 millimeter lenses. I told you our pupil at maximum opening is seven millimeters. These are five times larger in diameter, or five squared, 25 times the light collection area through these than with our unaided eye alone. You see, ladies and gentlemen, telescopes enable us to see the invisible. How many want to see the invisible? I'm there. <laughs> I want to see the invisible. They let us do that. They're also a time machine. When we point this telescope to the Andromeda galaxy, we're looking at the glow of its stars as they really appeared two million years ago. Why? Because the Andromeda galaxy lies a distance of two million light years away from us. And at the speed of light, it took two million years to reach the Earth. They're a time machine, and they allow us to see the invisible. Now, the good news is, the bigger the lens or mirror of our telescope, the more light it gathers, allowing us to see fainter and fainter stars. These binoculars will enable us to see hundreds of stars that were invisible to our unaided eye. So my question to you now is, which pair of binoculars would you prefer to look through? These or these? <laughs> Do I have a vote for these? And I think the reason why we were voting for the big ones, and I agree with you, is obvious, is that look at the size difference, the surface area difference, of the much bigger lenses of these binoculars versus their smaller counterparts. These are 20 by 80 binoculars, nearly 3 inch diameter lenses. With these binoculars, ladies and gentlemen, we see the rings of Saturn, craters on the moon like Swiss cheese, and dozens of other galaxies. We can literally see hundreds of stars that were invisible with these binoculars. Yes? Is there a maximum diameter? Yes. For a lens, there is because glass is an amorphous solid. It's sort of liquid in, in a way. And if we build the lenses too large, the thickness of the glass causes the weight to exceed an amount where it will literally warp under its own weight. The largest refractive telescope lens in the world is uh, in uh, Yerkes Observatory in Wisconsin. 
And I have actually looked through that telescope. It's a 40-inch refracted telescope. It's about 60 feet long, the tube of the telescope. It's, a, it's enormous. That's the biggest we'll ever go. We'll never build a bigger lens than that because of why I just described to you. Now, this reflective telescope uses a mirror. Mirrors are supported by a mirror cell, a flotation device, if you will. We can build them as big as we can handle. So there's no limit to the sizes of those. Now, uh, this reflective telescope has a mirror that's 200 millimeters in diameter, 8 inches across. Now what do we want to look for? The telescope, right? Because it gathers over 500 times more light than the unaided eye. Ladies and gentlemen, with that telescope, we can see thousands of stars that were invisible to the unaided eye. I'll put these up here. Is that blocking you? It's okay. Okay, so another feature about telescopes that I wanted to describe to you briefly is the larger the telescope, the greater its resolution or resolving power. Now what you see up here on the screen is just a picture of this cardboard right here. This right hand, sorry, this right hand sheet, if you will. Did my mic go off or is this going? So, all right, this, this, grit, this page here, how would you describe it? Now, please don't read anything into it. Don't guess. Let's act like a scientist. Just tell me objectively, what is it you see? What do you see here? A great page, that's all it is, right? Now, what if I was to tell you that this great page is literally made up of one million dots? Would you believe me? Thanks for your vote of confidence. <laughs> I know I counted every one of them. No, not really. But it tells me it's portrait of a million. It's supposed to be a million dots here. Now, how can we prove there are dots here? Well, what if I was to take these magnifiers? Let me gather them together here for you and show you these magnifiers. What if I was to hold this uh, eight power magnifier up to the sheet? What would we see? And then, if you know me, I don't like to stop there. I like to keep going. Maybe you do too. Then I got a 30 power magnifier and I held it up there with a little light on it. I took a picture through that too, by the way. I'm going to show you up on the screen. And I didn't even stop there. Then I took a 100 power magnifier and I held it up to the page. You want to see what they look like? Yes. Here's the 8 power. At 8, power, eight times magnification, Dots are revealed. We can actually see the gray page is really dots. It's not a smooth gray page after all. And those little dots, there's a number of them there, a large number, appear to be small, but they do appear to be little perfect disks, do they not? What do you think the difference will be with the 30 power magnifier? Bigger dots? I agree. Maybe a different shape. What else? Fewer. Why fewer dots? A smaller, narrower field of view of the whole page, the whole picture. I agree totally. Anything else? How about the distance between the dots? Bigger too, maybe? Let's see if our theory is correct. Ready? 30 power, we're right. The dots are bigger, the spaces between the dots are enlarged, and, and there are fewer dots there now. But the dots still look like perfect little disks, don't they? So what will the 100 power reveal? Let's see. Only nine dots in our field of view now, but the dots are so enlarged that now we can see plainly that each of these dots is not a perfect little disk. It's made up of blotches. Doesn't it look just like an inkjet put down on a piece of paper, which is really what it is, right? It looks like a blotch of ink. So what happened here is that when we look at Jupiter in the sky, and I say, look, guys, there's Jupiter, and it looks like a bright star, well, you'll take my word for it. But let's prove it. Let's look at Jupiter through the telescope. The telescope will resolve it as a disk with features and details on the disk of Jupiter so that we can see it really is truly a planet, just like these dots on this page. Resolution, technically defined, is the ability to separate close objects that appear as one into separate distinct objects. It has to do with the clarity of the image and separating close objects delicate features on extended objects, and even double stars were in space between them. Now, this is a picture of something that some of you may be familiar with. Anybody recognize it? That's right. Good job. It's the Milky Way, our galaxy that we live in. It's looking toward a summer constellation, Sagittarius, in one of the arms of our galaxy, a spiral arm. We're in a spiral galaxy. So it's a higher concentration of stars. 
than other parts of the sky. And uh, during the summer, how many have actually witnessed this glow band of light, this faint glow on the sky above you? How many have seen that before? If you haven't, try to make a point of doing it this summer. It's difficult to see it during the winter, but during the summer it's pretty easy on a dark country night. All right? Now, what is this band of glowing light really? It's thousands upon thousands of unresolved stars, just like the dots on the great page. If we simply hold even a small pair of binoculars up at that glow, we'll see separate, distinct points of light, the stars that are making it up. So resolution is important to astronomy. Now for the big part of my talk here, how big is the universe? How small is the universe? In order to answer those questions, we'll need to go back in time about 2,000 years ago when a Greek philosopher was alive named Democritus. Now Democritus thought in his mind, as we would in a more modern sense today, that if we had a sheet of aluminum foil and we tore it in half and discarded one and kept the other, and then we tore that half in half for a quarter, and then an eighth and then a sixteenth, and we kept dwindling it down to the smallest piece of aluminum foil. Aluminum, a pure substance, an element, has properties, physical properties like other metals, right? Shiny, they have luster, they're good conductors of heat and electricity, they're ductile, they're malleable, stuff like that. What if we got down to the smallest fragment of aluminum that still maintained the properties of aluminum? What would we call that smallest fragment? In the Greek, it's A-T-O-M-O-S, atomos, and that's where we came up with our English word atom from. It's an atom, the smallest building block of that material, if you will. All right? Now, the word atomos in the Greek literally means indivisible. You've heard the word before, one nation, under God, indivisible. What does it mean to be indivisible? Can't get smaller, you can't break it down into any smaller pieces. Is that true of the atom to our knowledge today? No. It's not. We know the atom can be divided into these subatomic particles. Like if this whole room for, was an atom, for example, most of it would be empty space. It would be orbited within this empty space by very fast moving, very tiny low mass particles we call electrons, which have a negative electrical charge to them. And then if we went to the center of the room, there would be the nucleus of the atom, where over 99.9% .9 of the mass of the entire atom is located. It would be the size of a pinprick in the middle of this entire room at that scale. The nucleus is tiny, and yet almost all the mass is locked up in there. Well, that's got my curiosity up. Knock, knock, who's inside of there? Positive electrical charge protons, and neutral or zero net charge neutrons. They're both about the same mass. We call one atomic mass unit. All right? An electron is about 1 1836th of that. It would take almost 2,000 of them to equal those. So there's so much more massive than the electrons outside the nucleus. That's why most of the mass is in the nucleus. And then the protons and the neutrons can be further subdivided into what we call quarks. Now, we've identified a few hundred different subatomic particles, leptons, muons, gluons, neutrinos, etc. Some of them with fanciful names or rather strange names. As a matter of fact, one of the quarks is called strange. Right? But uh, we do know about all these subatomic particles now. Wait a minute. The word atom, it no longer lives up to its name, which means indivisible. Should we change the name? How many say no, leave it alone? I agree with you. It's been around 2,000 years. Leave it alone. Besides, it is the smallest piece that maintains the properties of that material it's made up of, right? But it, it can be divided. So maybe we should just leave it alone as the word atom. All right? We'll just leave it as atom. It's still in the textbooks as atom. Should we apply that same reasoning to the planet Pluto? <laughs> Okay, maybe we'll revisit that one later. Okay, well, I want, to, I want to talk to you about atoms compared to a human cell. How many atoms, average size atoms, would it take side by side to equal the thickness of one average human cell? Well, how thick is a human cell? 
if we look at the thickness of one sheet of paper, 20 weight paper, it's about four human cells thick. So a human cell is pretty small, but an atom is much smaller than that. So how many atoms would it take to equal the thickness of one human cell? Would you believe it would take 100,000 of them? Yes, 100,000 atoms. My next question is slightly larger than the previous. How many human cells would it take stacked one on top of the other to equal an average person's tallness or height from the bottom of our feet to the top of our head? Let's say we average 5 foot 8 inches tall. How many human cells would it take to reach that height? Would you believe 100,000 of them? And you know what? We could actually prove it. We can get reams of paper. Library probably has lots of reams of We can stack them up and measure the number of sheets. Remember, four human cells per sheet? It's 100,000 of them, ladies and gentlemen. My next question is even larger still. How many people standing feet on top of head will it take to equal the diameter of our planet Earth 8,000 miles across? Do I have any volunteers, please? How many people would it take standing feet on top of head to reach across the earth? Would you believe 10 million? That's a lot of volunteers. And don't you feel sorry for that bottom person? Or are they going to have a headache when we're done, right? Yeah. My next question is larger still. How many earth diameters side by side would it take to go from the sun all the way out to distant Pluto, about 3.67 billion miles away? How many earths? Would you believe 10 million of them? Nice round numbers, aren't they? And going from the solar system to the Milky Way galaxy, the galaxy we live in, 100,000 light years across the span of our Milky Way galaxy, from one spiral arm edge to the other, a distance of 100,000 light years. Remember, a light year is 6 trillion miles. 600 quadrillion miles across the Milky Way galaxy. How many solar systems would it take to go across there? 10 million of them. And my last question is my largest this evening. How many Milky Way galaxies from one edge to the other would it take to span the distance across the entire known, detectable, observable universe in a three-dimensional field? How many? Somebody said 10 million. Good guess. Back to 100,000. So large is our Milky Way galaxy. All right, well, my question to you now is going from the very small atoms to the very large, the whole entire known universe. How many atoms would it take to get across that entire known universe? Oh, you're asking a lot here, Dr. Manning. Well, wouldn't it be all these numbers multiplied together here? Here's the number. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that is 1 followed by 36 zeros. 1 times 10 to the 36th power. Can you see okay? 1 times 10 to the 36th. Anybody know the name of that number? They should create a TV show called Name That Number. Any scientists, mathematicians here? What's the name of that number? It's called 1 dodecadillion. 1 dodecadillion atoms to go across the entire known universe. Mercy. Let's look at it from another perspective, shall we? Now, notice here, going out from the sun in order, I have Mercury, then Venus, then the Earth, and then Mars. And then I skipped past the Jovian worlds, you know, the gas giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, to get to someone we don't even think is a planet anymore, Pluto. Although I still think it's a planet. Now, what does Pluto have in common with these other four guys? Well, you know what? All five of these bodies are terrestrial or rocky planets. In other words, they have a solid ground to stand on. They're not just a gas giant where you would just fall through like a cloud, like Jupiter. Now, of these five that have that in common, who's the big one? We are, right? Planet Earth. Can you see the smile on his face and the gleam in his eyes? I'm the big planet in this neck of the woods. Is the Earth really that big, though? Oh my goodness, look what just happened to the Earth. It just got a sad face on it. Because now it's been humbled. Look at Pluto. It's down to a P on this scale compared to the Jovian worlds. Uranus, Neptune, Jupiter, Saturn without the rings, the second largest planet. But look at Jupiter. 
the biggest planet in our solar system. Look at the red spot, the great red spot on Jupiter.